Good evening and welcome to the Retreat and Conference Center at the Immaculate Conception Seminary here in Huntington, Long Island. The Retreat Center is open year-round. We hold retreats, days of reflection. Dioceses have their clergy come for formation and their annual retreat. We've had dioceses from New York and Brooklyn here in Rockwell Center. The Diocese of Bridgeport will be coming uh, in, the, in the fall. And there are numerous school groups uh, that utilize the facility for confirmation retreats, high school retreats, vocation retreats, and we have a full service um, for all who would come here, uh, food service, and also uh, lodging, and great rooms for uh, recreation, and for conferences, and for meetings. So please avail yourself to our seminary when you have the chance and opportunity. I'm Monsignor Stephen Camp. I'm the rector and superior of the seminary. I'm also the pastor of the local parish, St. Patrick's here in Huntington Village. It has 6,300 families in the parish boundaries, and the seminary is also included in those boundaries. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today, in particular to Monsignor Peter Vicar, um, the president of the Christian Near East Welfare Association. I also welcome him back because this was his home for many years as the rector when the Diocese of Rockville Center in Brooklyn operated the seminary here, and when the transfer took place of Rockville Center, Brooklyn, and the Archdiocese to Dunwoody, he continued as rector there. He is known for his great intellect, his goodness, his great formation skills as a formator for young men for the priesthood, and a true Christian gentleman. In his current ministry, he continues to bring all of those qualities and that the church needs most, his genuineness, his faith, his love and compassion for people and for Christ and his church. I welcome him here and all of you here today. And it is my personal pleasure to welcome him back because he and I have worked with different students along the way. We've shared insights about them. And I think we've been pretty correct about most of them along the way. I'd ask, now ask Bishop Henning to come forward and to offer our opening prayer. Good evening. My apologies that I am not going to be with you at your event. I, I'm actually here uh, with another event <laughs> and slipped out for a few minutes just to say a word and, and offer a prayer. Um, I'm very grateful uh, to Dan, a good friend, for asking me to uh, offer a word. I'm very grateful to Monsignor Vacari uh, for his uh, welcome as well. Um, I also know him for many years, worked for him, studied uh, under him, and one of my courses with you was an independent study in communion ecclesiology. And I mention that because it strikes me that uh, Kinewa is an extraordinary organization in which we're not really talking just about philanthropy. Of course, it is about philanthropy and helping people in need, but there's a very real sense in this organization that it is an organization that fosters communion, uh, communion among people, communion among people sometimes of different faiths and across great distances. Uh, it is uh, on a scale that allows the interaction with those in need to be very deeply personal um, and to have that element of encounter. Uh, so again, this is not just about giving something to someone, it is in a very real sense entering into a relationship of faith and compassion and one that goes both ways. To participate in the work of Kanewa is to be blessed uh, by that encounter uh, with others, others of faith, and particularly people who may be struggling to live that life of faith in those very difficult circumstances. And so I invite us now to turn to the Lord in prayer, giving thanks for the gift of this organization and its wonderful work. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this evening for your many good gifts. We give you thanks for generous hearts, for people who give witness to their faith even in the midst of suffering and war. We give you thanks for the peacemakers, 
for those who draw people together. We give you thanks for the gift of solidarity and communion, knowing that joy of having a brother or sister. We give you thanks for this gathering and for all those who turn now to this work and seek to participate in and support this work of communion and of compassion and of support for our Christian brothers and sisters in the Near East. We give you thanks especially for the witness of those churches in the Near East as they show to us their courage and their tenacity in the face sometimes of violence and persecution. And we ask your blessing, Lord, upon this gathering and all who gathered here. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, thank you to Dan and to Monsignor Vicari. Thank you to all of you for your interest in and generosity to Kneema. God bless you. Good evening, I'm uh, Dan Searby from the host committee and I want to welcome everyone and thank you for coming out tonight. Um, we have with us this evening four of the last five rectors of this seminary of the Immaculate Conception in uh, Monsignor Camp, in the order Monsignor Fink, who's going to lead us in closing prayer, Bishop Henning, and Monsignor Vicari, and that's the uh, pastoral equivalent of the 1927 Yankees. So we're, we're very fortunate to have them with us. I want to thank the host committee and all the work that, that has gone into this event. That's uh, Peter Bahu and uh, Karen Rorecker from Peter's Way Pilgrimages. Uh, Peter Bahu is here with us tonight. That Liz Harrington, who's counsel to the seminary, can't be with us tonight. Uh, Tony McLaughlin is with us and Francis Mortardi. So thank you all for your work in, in putting together this event. Um, I also want to thank the seminary for their hospitality, Monsignor Camp, who welcomed us here, and Linda Zola, who is the director of hospitality. That's uh, been wonderful to work with on this. So tonight we're here in the House of Mary, the Seminary of the Immaculate Conception. And we remember 2,000 years ago, a Palestinian teenager said yes to an angel and put salvation history into motion. And thank you all for saying yes, for being here, and for supporting Kaniwa and its work. Uh, in 2011, I made my first trip to the Holy Land, and I returned full of the Spirit, and most, most energized by the witness of the women and men, Christians, uh, largely Palestinian Christians in the Holy Land, and just the, the, their faith and, and endurance. They're known as the living stones. And was, came to the seminary and was taking a class here, Monsignor Vicari's church history class, and asked Monsignor Vicari, what's the best vehicle for supporting and being attached to the, uh, the living stones? And he directed me to Kaniwa. Um, flash forward 2016, that uh, there's a pilgrimage that Monsignor Bukhari led. Uh, that's Monsignor Bukhari with a Palestinian guard at the uh, Basilica of the Nativity in Bethlehem. And you just look at the body language. Who has the authority here? It's Monsignor Bukhari. Um, the next slide is at the Senegal, the site of the Last Supper, the site of Christ, peace be with you appearance. St. Thomas said, my Lord and my God, the sight of the Holy Spirit coming to the disciples. That's Monsignor Vicari's brother, Andrew, on the left. Monsignor Andrew Vicari, a Brooklyn priest. So here we have uh, Peter and Andrew, fishers of men, um, and just great, great spiritual examples. Um, in 2020, Monsignor Vicari was taken out of the seminary at St. Joseph's in, in Yonkers, and made president of Kaniwa. Now, there are no coincidences. And Kaniwa and its work, and you'll hear more about that tonight, is a great representation of the Jewish, uh, the Jewish directive of tikkun olam, ma'fut shaddai. And that's basically repairing the world by building the kingdom of God. And all of you tonight are helping build the kingdom of God by being here. Thank you. Give you the thoughts in your Peter Picard.
So I'm just going to leave our microphone at the table for questions and answers. Uh, Trasul Singh Connolly, who is our CFO, will bring the microphone to you, and this way we can hopefully have a very good conversation uh, during the time that we're here together. I want to begin by expressing my gratitude and the gratitude of my team uh, for the reception that you have given to us, starting with Monsignor Camp, the rector here in the past of St. Patrick's. Monsignor and I, as he mentioned, have known each other and have worked together very closely on some very important issues, and I've always been very grateful for his wisdom and his guidance. So thank you very much for the welcome that I have shared with us here. Um, my welcome, my thanks also goes to Bishop Henning, uh, Bishop Henning, as he pointed out, was here as a seminary, and now, of course, he plays such an important role both in the Diocese of Rockville Center and because of his membership with the USCCB, he plays a very significant role um, and has for many years in terms of the experiencing of welcoming, particularly immigrants, uh, into, our, into our land, into our territory. So I thank uh, Bishop Henning for being here. I also want to express my thanks to Dan Serby, to Dan's presence here. It was really Dan who was the inspiration uh, behind this. It was Dan who had the idea that we should have this kind of an event at the Seminary of the Immaculate Conception out in Huntington. So I thank you, Dan, for really all the work that you have done in terms of the idea behind this and then putting together and inviting members who are here to join the host committee. I thank all the members of the host committee for all the work that you have done here. Uh, I think we're all very, very grateful for the opportunity um, that we have here this evening. Final way of kind of introduction is just really to introduce my team. And that's important because this is not about any single voice. It's not about any single voice, certainly not mine. It's about a team, a team that's at work in New York, a team that's at work in the other offices where we are. So I brought my team along here, and I'm gonna just ask you to stand. Tom, Thomas Marghese is our Director of Programs. All the programs that we discuss in our offices and throughout the 15 countries where we work, those programs and we work with partners, with partners they go through Thomas Marghese. I'm so grateful, Thomas, that you blocked out the time to be here. I also want to introduce uh, the House of Trisul, Trisul Singh Conway, who is our CFO. So she is the one who really oversees and really requires of me the kind of accountability and the transparency that working together, we are always trying to show to any of our donors, benefactors, potential donors, and of course, first and foremost, well, first and foremost to the donors, but in particular, thanks to Thomas's years and Trisul's years, uh, working with Kinewa, um, have a very in-depth grasp of those places where we work. And Trisul, I'm very grateful to you for the guidance that you have given me since I transitioned from seminary uh, into Kinewa and Pontifical Mission. I thank you very much. Noel Dennis. Noel Siglisi is our Director of Development, and Noel is really the one who is leading his team. He's here tonight with Hendot. Hendot Sola and Noel work with the development team. And as we are now beginning to increase the number of places where we're going, where we're traveling, again, Noel, I thank you, and I thank your whole team for the work that you have done in terms of the preparation for these different opportunities that we're getting. Uh, this week, this is our second opportunity. We have two opportunities next week. And so as these opportunities multiply to be able to really share the story of Kinewa, I think it is something that is very important that I just recognize the team that I am only representing. Noel, I thank you very much. Hinda, I thank you very much. Tim is also here. I saw him here. Uh, Tim, there he is, walking across down the floor. Tim is our Director of Creative Services. Tim, I thank you for all that you have put together and in particular with the work that you have done with the team that we have in the back there so we can live stream this. So that has been very important and I'm very grateful. One question, we're getting a little bit of feedback from your microphone. You want me to just use that? Yes. See how long? Well, with that, I think I have introduced everybody on the team and would like not to proceed. What we're going to do this evening is just first some opening words for anyone who may not be that familiar with the mission of Kinewa, starting with its actual name, uh, but then also move into some of the general work that we do, and then in particular, I think what probably drew most of you here this evening, and that is Kinewa and Ukraine. 
all right? And in particular, most recently, uh, the trip that His Eminence Cardinal Dolan asked me to organize, it was a Canela trip. And what the goal of the Cardinal, the Cardinal Dolan sits, the Archbishop of New York, sits as the chair of the Board of Trustees of Catholic Near East Welfare Association and Pontifical Mission. That's our full name, okay? So, as chair, from time to time, and of course the team here, in particular with regard to Thomas and Trasul, who have been here for so many years, they have experienced how from time to time he decides he's going to go and to pay a pastoral visit in places where we are working. Here, the original plan that the Cardinal had expressed when we were at the Board of Trustees meeting was that we would make this pastoral, this year's pastoral visit would be into Cairo. Our office from Beirut is responsible for what goes on in a number of countries, including Egypt. Then came February 24th. With what developed after February 24th in terms of the Russian, the, the invasion of the Russian Federation into the sovereign state of Ukraine and what we were all exposed to in terms of social media and whatever media platforms we are familiar with, we saw the enormity of the suffering. We saw the destruction of life, we saw the destruction of property and all the other things that so many of us, I'm sure, have so many images in our mind that we experienced. With that, his evidence decided that the place that should be visited should be for those Ukrainian refugees, technically and defined by terms of the United Nations, that refers to those people who have left their homeland and gone to another country, and he wanted to see as many of those as possible, as we could, given his very tight schedule, as well as what we call technically the IDPs, internally displaced persons. Those would be Ukrainians who had to move maybe from the south, Mariupol, I'm sure you've all seen those images, moving from the south and moving into the western part of Ukraine, or maybe moving from eastern parts of Ukraine further into the west for safety. They did not leave the country, they're not technically refugees, but they are IDPs. And the Cardinal, according to his schedule and according to security arrangements, wanted to be able to visit with as many of those people as possible. So that's the background for what we're talking about here tonight. And so I think, Hamda, if you could start us off, you've got a good sense right here in terms of basic background to Kinewa, all right? If you just kind of take a look at that for a moment, you see here the particular regions in the world where we work. Uh, one piece that I would add to this here is that, and it's important, it's very important for us to remember, our basic mandate is the mandate of the gospel. That's the, that's the fundamental mandate, the mandate of the gospel, okay? In addition to that, as a papal agency, our specific mandate then comes as an ecclesial mandate, is to Eastern Catholic churches, Eastern Catholic churches. So among the 24 churches that make up the Catholic Church, in full communion with one another and with the Bishop of Rome, 23 of them are Eastern Catholic churches which is a very interesting topic and one that we could spend time on in terms of the discussion from an historical and cultural point of view. But at least for right now, suffice to note that our responsibility is for the Eastern Catholic Churches. Next month, I'll be going to Rome when the Congregation for the Eastern Churches meets to discuss different issues, including Ukraine, that pertain to the work of all those agencies that are working. But we are the papal agency who have the mandate for, as we put here, the humanitarian and pastoral support for Eastern Catholic churches. Amen. Okay. This is good, as I mentioned before, we are located in 15 different countries, not offices in 15 countries, but we're working in 15 countries. So whether we have offices, these here that you see are right now ones that are highlighted because of the intensity of the work. Um, but the offices that we have are in New York, its headquarters, in Ottawa, and then in the Middle East in Jerusalem, in Beirut, in Amman. We are also in the Horn of Africa, where we have offices in Ethiopia and in Eritrea. And then our other, other offices in Erakinakalam in India. The other places that you see that are not the ones I mentioned are under our care, and we work there either indirectly or with other partners. Examples here, as I mentioned, we work in Egypt out of the Beirut office. We work in Iraq. I was there last Thanksgiving and throughout Iraqi Kurdistan. We work in Syria. We work in Georgia, Armenia, and of course right now, our work with multiple partners, but primarily with Caritas Ukraine in Ukraine. That's where we're working. Amen. Okay. 
Uh, this is just a very good overview, I think, for you to see how we work. I mentioned here when I introduced, when I, um, when I started, how there is no single voice. We are a team. And that's why I wanted to introduce the team. It's important the way this applies here. There is no place where we just go in on our own. Doesn't, that's not what we're, we're not about that. We're not structured that way, okay? Anytime that we're going to go into a place, we're going to have proper consultation with the papal nuncio and all the individual groups that you see there. So for example, on this most recent trip, before the Cardinal went to Poland, he already knew I had contacted the papal nuncio in Warsaw. Before the Cardinal went into Slovakia, he already knew I had contacted the papal nuncio. And before we went into, and so on and so forth. So whether it's in terms of papal nuncios, the same would apply. The term eparch is an Eastern Catholic term, which is similar to a Latin bishop. Bishop Henning is a bishop. An eparch would be a bishop in the Eastern Catholic churches. Priests, and you will see in the slides and over and over, the tremendous amount of work that we do, especially with women religious especially with women religious. All right? They are so vitally important in all the regions where we work. With lay leadership, this refers to an increasing number of women and men who are involved in particular with the different programs that Thomas Varghese would be able to comment on depending on which particular region you might want to know about. Amen. From the time this all began, back late January, early February, as tension was mounting in Ukraine, I articulated then and repeat here again, Kinewa and Pontifical Mission has three priorities. Priority number one is this, nothing can replace solidarity and prayer. Tomorrow the church celebrates the feast of Our Lady of Fatima. We pray to, the feast, we pray to Our Lady of Fatima for peace. I ask each one of you tonight, tomorrow, to pray to offer a rosary to Our Lady of Fatima, seeking her intercession for peace. Peace in Ukraine, peace in our own republic, peace throughout the world, and peace in the hearts of each one of us, and especially here in our own republic. Solidarity and prayer. The second priority that we have is in the dissemination of correct information. I invite all of you who perhaps are not familiar to go to our website. On the website, you can then also go to the magazine one or to the blog that we have. I think there you will see a pretty good uh, review of situations and places where we're working. And finally, the final thing is for us to be able to raise funds. So the three priorities, very clear, prayer, dissemination of accurate information, and what can we do on a humanitarian level to be able to give support in those places where people are in need. Amen. So we begin here, again, we chose some of these selections from some places. You're all familiar with the different images that you are seeing as you watch whatever media platform you're accustomed to. These initial, um, these initial slides are going to be slides from different parts, like here is Kharkiv, but these are going to be from different parts of eastern and southern Ukraine uh, that obviously have been most directly affected in a devastating way in these days. Here, this is Mariupol. I think we're all familiar with some of the tragedies and horror stories that have come from Mariupol. It is one of the places where we were involved, particularly in helping in the soup kitchen in Mariupol. All right, but this is an image of one of the places that we certainly are find ourselves in. This slide and the next one, these two slides are both slides that are taken basically from a bunker that is used in Kyiv. The major, the major metropolitan who has not abandoned his people in Kyiv continues to function from the bunker under the cathedral. And as most churches, and I'll comment on this a little further, have done, they have turned their churches and whatever other property they have over to the people, regardless of age, and yes, regardless of faith. We are a Catholic agency, but as we're about to help someone who needs water or medicine or food, we don't ask them to show us our, their baptismal certificate. We're not interested in that. We are interested in bringing help to people who are suffering as a papal agency trying to fulfill a basic gospel mandate. Amen. Here is the beginning, one of the scenes that we saw in terms of people leaving Ukraine and coming across into Poland. Now, one of the things that the Cardinal wanted to do, and he was, I think, satisfied that we were able to accomplish it, was to show, again, 
Nobody works in a silo. That's a recipe for frustration and failure all the time. Everyone works together, as a, and Bishop Henning said, as a church, we are a communion. A communion shows the kind of body that we all are. St. Paul said it best. When the hand hurts, the whole body hurts. When the stomach hurts, the leg hurts, the whole body hurts. All right? So we all work together to try to bring about healing, to try to bring about whatever can be done to bring, to help people who are deprived of basic human dignity, if you will. What does that mean for us? It meant that before we went, the Cardinal wanted to make sure that we were going to encounter other aid agencies at work. That's going to be, as an example, Caritas. Here you see the car, one of the Caritas groups that we went to visit. But again, people want to know, if donors want to know, where's my money going? How's my money being used? Where that money is going and how that money is being used is to help the people that you're seeing in all of these slides. Here we are in Poland. Here the Cardinal visited the Caritas group that is trying to help people at this particular site, which happens to be one of the three train stations where we went. And it was one of the most powerful, one of the most effective places where we went, where we would meet those Ukrainians who had come, who were able to escape from Ukraine and come into Poland. That was also going to be the case when we got to Slovakia. Amen. Again, it's the same theme in terms of what we are viewing here. It's people at work helping people with the most basic needs that they have. And I think that's an important message. And if there's a message that maybe you could even bring to other people who want to know what kind of help do they give. The kind of help that we give is what you're going to be seeing in each one of these slides. The people who are here are receiving what they need in terms of medicine, in terms of food, in terms of clothing, and also, and we learned this on the trip, in terms of the need to get clean water. Why? Because as we learned when we got to Ukraine, one of the things that the Russians are doing is to poison the rivers. So by poisoning the rivers, it was depriving people from where they would go for just natural refreshment. And so this becomes an important part of the task. Again, similar in terms of what we were trying to do, the particular locations I don't think are as important as what you can see, the work that's being done with the people and for the people, by trying to give them what is deprived. They're deprived here not only of basic food and shelter, they're deprived of their family life which has been disrupted, foundationally disrupted, as you know. As Ukrainian families started to leave, particularly from the east and the south, and head west toward the Polish border, toward the border with Slovakia, toward the border with Hungary, toward the border with Romania, toward the border with Moldova, to any of them. A family that was coming, which had young children and young mothers and a young father was stopped. The mother and the child or children were permitted to cross. The father or the brother or the uncle was told to stop because he had to take up arms to defend Ukraine. Now, that does result for a child in a traumatic experience. And that then is what we need to be on the ground to respond to. And you begin to see those moments. This is perhaps one of the most unique maps and something which I don't think any of you have seen, I don't think you've seen it, on any of the public networks. This is a map that is generated by Kanewa and Pontifical Mission to show, there you have Ukraine, you can take a look, the map, the map is pretty self-explanatory in terms of where we have been working. Again, we don't have an office in Ukraine. We work through partnerships. We work with Caritas Ukraine. We're in communication with Caritas Ukraine. We collaborate with the Knights of Columbus. We collaborate with the Order of Malta. We collaborate with Aid to the Church in Need. It's about collaboration. It's about building partnerships. It's about working together. And that's very much what we are dedicated to do and rely on the support our donors to be able to continue. But you get a sense here in terms of the extent to which um, the different places where we've been able to have projects and hopefully we'll be able to return to some of the projects. Again, here you have an example of the work that is being done by groups that we're working with, another Caritas group in Poland working here in terms of trying to give basic food to people who are coming across. Here is the, the stop that we made in one of the first parishes in Poland. 
And you see here, these are Ukrainian people, with the exception, you see, I don't think, any place that we went, for just for the record, I never, you never have to introduce Cardinal Dolan. As soon as Cardinal Dolan walks into a railway station, or Cardinal Dolan walks into a parish, this is in Ukraine, Slovakia, Poland, it didn't make any difference. He does not have to be, so it made things a lot easier, because you're trying to get through the introductions, the first one is given. Now, let's move on to everybody else that's in the picture, so to speak. I would say that in front of him too, so. But the thing is, the fellow who's smiling there and looking straight up at him and at the woman, this became, again, an example. This is a, a member of the Knights of Columbus, who became very important to us, as we are to them, in terms of showing this theme of collaboration, partnership, working together, a team effort. And he was very helpful in, making, in, in bringing that about, as were the Knights of Columbus. Here, in these two slides that we've seen, Cardinal Dolan is being received is being received in this parish. One of the things that we learned early on, when somebody raised the question with the delegation that we were traveling with, maybe you've already heard this, but one of the questions came up, did you go to any of the Ukrainian, did you go to see any of the camps in Poland where Ukrainian refugees were being kept? And the answer is no. And the question is, well, we had millions of Ukrainians who were refugees into Poland, into um, all the other countries that I mentioned, why not? Because there are no Ukrainian camps. The, ex the part of the story that really was a story to be learned here was just not of the plight and the suffering of the Ukrainian people, but of the heroism and the biblical virtue of hospitality that was being lived by the people of Poland and Slovakia. No camps. All the Ukrainian people who came across all the Ukrainian people who came across were being received into their church facilities. All the Ukrainian people who came across, there was a place that was designated where they went, no camps. And so that's why this is the kind of reception that we were going to receive and that the Polish people gave. Here again, another train station. Uh, at this particular train station, uh, we were followed by, well, part of the train. They didn't come into Ukraine with us but we were followed by um, Channel 7 News and Channel 4 News. So this is the Channel 7 News um, anchor um, questioning or having an interview with Cardinal Dolan. The bishop that you see who's standing next to Cardinal Dolan is Bishop John Bonici, an auxiliary bishop of the Archdiocese of New York. Again, near the train station where we found that there was another tent here where just basic food, as people who were fleeing Ukraine were coming in through the train station, now their lives had been disrupted. They at least had a moment of relief that they were out of the danger of what was going on in Ukraine, but they still looked for basic necessities, whether that's going to be just, it was the biblical story, it was the story of the Beatitudes, it was the story of Jesus saying, when I was thirsty, you gave me to drink, when I was hungry, you gave me to eat, when I was naked, you, when I was naked, you clothed me. This was the story of the Polish people and the people in Slovakia working with these persons, these individuals, but through aid agencies. So this is where the story can be weaved as one. Amen. This one here, and the next one, these two stories go together. After we left Poland, we went to Slovakia. We went in Slovakia to the city of Kosice. Kosice is the bishop we had been in communication with, but what was important here is, as all of the, again, we are a Catholic church, a communion church, and so here it was a matter of the local bishop wanting to organize, yes, all the stations for food, all the stations for medicine, all the other things that they need, they also need moments of prayer. No one can diminish the power of prayer. And in this prayer service here, what you saw in the slide before, and what you're looking at here, moved his eminence and also the mother that you see here, because they told the stories of what their journey was like out of Ukraine into Slovakia. This was such a moving moment on our trip that several of the people, even in our delegation, had to excuse themselves for the rest of the day because they were just so emotionally impacted by the stories of these young women whose lives had been just totally turned upside down and inside out. I ask you just to pause to think about moments like this. Right? This is the human encounter that takes place. And that human encounter becomes a moment of grace. Uh, next slide. So this, I, now I'm not trying to go through the other slide, but it wasn't important, but it wasn't as, as important as this one. 
This is important because here Cardinal Dolan, myself, and then the one of the bishops, and the two people that are important here are the man that's looking at you sitting on the other side. Why? One of the places we went to in the Polish city of Szemyszel, the Polish city of Szemyszel is right on the border between Poland and Ukraine. And what is important here is this was a place now for Ukrainian refugees as they came into the city to be able to start to establish basic documentation if they needed social security, if they needed work papers, whatever documentation that they needed to now re-establish their lives for at least some period of time. And I emphasize only some period of time. Why? Because there was no Ukrainian refugee or internal refugee that we met who wants to remain anywhere further west than the border between Ukraine and Poland. The goal for the Ukrainians is to return to their state and reclaim their state, not to continue traveling west. However, it was important, and these very helpful civil servants were going to provide them for at least a temporary means to be able to stay to set up their lives. So that's what you're looking at here. Here we travel to the seminary. Next. At the seminary, I'll just make one comment on it, but I want you to focus on, again, the parish. This word, here we are in Ukraine. Both the, the previous slide from the seminary and then this slide here, both we are now in Ukraine, in Lviv. This is where we are. The seminary itself, what you saw there was called Madon and a bunch of seminarians. And then while we were on the property, while we were on the property of the seminary, um, at one point again we had a meeting with the Knights of Columbus where they showed us and they brought us to this huge truck. If you can think of the largest moving van that you've ever seen, I remember distinctly, and after it was time to leave here, after 24 years, the moving vans that took us out of here and took us up to Dunwoody. If you can think of the largest moving van that you ever saw, the KFC, who have a moving van which they keep on the property of the seminary, is for the purpose of loading up this as a mobile, as a mobile unit to carry everything needed. What do they need? They need medicine, they need food, they need clean water because the Russians are poisoning the rivers. They need shelter, they need food, and they also need, and this was very important, we didn't do that, we're not doing it, but it was pointed out to me by um, some Ukrainian officials, what we need are bulletproof vests. And bulletproof vests, Kanewa is not in the business of any kind of a political or military statement. But the bulletproof vests, and it has to be grade five and above, the bulletproof vests are because what is happening is Ukrainian people who are healthy enough to go to one of these mobile supply stations and get medicine or food or clean water and then bring it back to their mother or their grandparent or maybe a group of people who cannot leave a hospital or a nursing home are being shot by the Russians. So as they're being shot carrying aid to the people who cannot get out, the bulletproof vests go to the aid workers. All right, where Kanewa, people ask me, is Kanewa political? The answer is yes. Kanewa is political, why? Because of the mystery of the incarnation. The word became flesh, that makes us political. That means we have to act, but we are never partisan. That is of no interest to us. Political, yes, partisan, never. Parish. Here we move to the university, the Greek university, Catholic University in Lviv. This is one of the most important places in Lviv, and it becomes a place not only for what we know universities to be important for, obviously, but also because the university now is giving a place of refuge to the internally displaced Ukrainian people, and they can find their refuge on the property of the center of the university. The woman who is leading us here, that you see with her hands extended, she was of extreme importance in terms of helping us to understand, to appreciate, and both at the university and at the seminary when we were there, they were able to bring us to meet foreign, further Ukrainian people who had been suffering. Um, one instance that comes to mind, maybe you did see it on the TV, we at one point entered a room which was filled with internally displaced Ukrainians. We saw a young man sitting on the floor at one end of the cot. At the other end of the cot was his mother. The young man, maybe in his late 20s, went into absolute shock at the time of the bombing of his, of his town. He has not spoken since. He has not spoken since. And his mother just sits with him throughout the day and every day, 
hoping, praying that maybe her eyes touching his, in some way there will be some verbal reaction. He has not spoken. Right. These are the kinds of scenes. This vice rector, the woman who is here, was helpful, most helpful to us in terms of also giving us a little more background in terms of what the university is able to do to house some of these internally displaced people. Amen. Okay, here there was an opportunity on the part of the youth, the youth of the university, to be able to interview Cardinal Dolan. And the Cardinal, of course, was available to anybody who wanted an interview, but this was a very powerful encounter where this young person expressed the hopes of the Ukrainian youth he also expressed the gratitude of the Ukrainian people for all of the donors that Cardinal Dolan represented coming from Kinewa. Because for all the slides that we've seen here, it's about people, it's about people who are suffering, and it's about what we are able to do because of the generosity of our donors and benefactors. So at this moment, as, Cardinal, as this young man did to Cardinal, I can say to you, and I know I speak for the whole team, thank you. Because what we're able to do, we're only able to do because of you and because of those who also are joining us, and I want to welcome them on live stream. Amen. Here is um, for the Ukrainian people as they cross the border in the town of Rebenne, the town of Rebenne in Poland, as they cross the border, literally at a distance from here to the Rose Garden, you all know where that is, at a distance from here to the Rose Garden, the first thing that the Ukrainian people see is that tent on the right. That tent is a tent that is in collaboration between the Catholic Near East Welfare Association and Pontifical Mission, and the Knights of Columbus. So it's another form of partnership, another form of teamwork, another form of being connected and working together. And here is to receive all of the Ukrainian refugees that come through, at least at this junction, into, into Poland. And again, another, another site. You do see, I mean, I want to hold it out to you. You do see also the Kinewa logo and the Kinewa emblem that is also here on the outside of the tent in several places, as well as the Knights of Columbus and the inside. Uh, what you see on the lower right-hand side, Cardinal Dolan greeting those three sisters. I'm sure all of you here have some devotion to divine mercy. I'm sure all of you here perhaps had some kind of special prayers and parishes on Divine Mercy Sunday. One of the stops that we made, because this is all about trying to help people, get to people, but it's got to be rooted in internal and in interior silence and reception of God's will through prayer. We went to the shrine of uh, Sister Faustina in Poland. And so the sisters, her sisters, who also shared with us powerful stories about Sister Faustina, when they knew that we were coming to this place in Rebenne, the sisters left the shrine so they could come and greet and express their gratitude again to Cardinal Dolan. And here, offering Mass for the workers. Amen. Amen. And final slide, uh, when we got to the last parish in Poland, this is now in Warsaw, what we did was, um, obviously, I don't think I need to explain what that picture is. Okay, so are there any other comments or questions, either from any of you who are here? Thank you all so much for your time, for your attention, but I would like to listen to you and, and the team. So either I'll try to answer the question or if anything is coming in the chat, or will bring the microphone to any of you who may have a comment or a question. So if you do want to make a comment or a question, just raise your hand. And any comment on the live stream? companies, or where does it come from? Well, the medicine that has come, I don't know the particular pharmaceutical companies, how that is done, so I'm not going to just move to that question. I can get back to it. Uh, I was just wondering, Monsignor, if you could uh, express to uh, uh, the people in the uh, former mayo room here uh, precisely what happens uh, with, the, uh, with the funds. I think you had mentioned uh, earlier in uh, previous conversations that 100% uh, of uh, all the funds that are raised yes. go. Uh, could you elaborate on that, please? 
Thank you for that question. It is important to know that all funds that we are collecting for Ukraine, both the refugees and the IDPs, 100% of the donation goes to that end. We are not keeping kind of an administrative percentage or anything like that. It is 100% going to uh, the particular either Ukrainian refugee or the Ukrainian IDP. We're starting to now focus and we've been talking about trying to um, uh, continue to take the kinds of precautions, and we, we make no apologies for it. Uh, again, I'm very grateful to Thomas and to Trasul for the kind of precautions we have taken in terms of making sure that there's a safe transfer of any funds in terms of the banking information that we have. But 100% of the donation goes to the Ukrainian refugees and to the Ukrainian IDPs. You also mentioned the extent that you go through to see to it that the funds that are delivered and transferred directly to uh, the respective uh, aid agencies, uh, the difficulties that most other people have in trying to get those monies mm -hmm. there with the technology and that sort of thing. Can I ask Thomas and Trisul to comment? Sure, thank you. Uh, this was my personal experience. What happened is we tried to transfer some monies through Bank of America and we had friends and families who were, especially students from India had moved over to study and they were stranded and we were trying to reach some sort of money across and Bank of America just turned it down and said, it does not go through. There was no way funds could travel and that's what we were very worried about. You know, with all this technology and all kinds of hacking happened, we never wanted the funds going in the wrong hands or ending in the wrong account. And Putin has his hand over that and we were kind of a little concerned about that. Even now, you know, when we transfer monies to our regions where a Russian bank is an intermediary, it gets blocked. So we have to be very careful. So we constantly communicate with our partner on the other may maybe the bishop or a caritas or the nuncio we have directly we speak with them talk with them send emails back and forth we run a test runs to see if these bank accounts are valid and then the funds so that way we are very kind of seeing that the money goes in a secure passage I just want to add to that, that also the banking system that we use we have certain uh, in the Bank of New York, this is our bank, and they have certain procedures that make sure that these funds are going to the right place. If an account is not valid or so on, it blocks the fund from leaving our account. They also inform us with an email telling us that this is an invalid account or something of that sort. So I think from our uh, point, we try as much as possible to make sure that we are getting it where it needs to go and to make sure that all of the funds that are being transferred are being used in the right way that it should be used. Any other comments or questions? Thank you. There are a lot of other hot spots in the world, and I guess you mentioned Ethiopia, and obviously you've done a lot of work in Lebanon. Can you just give us a very brief, you know, some of the other work continues beyond Ukraine? Thank you, Dan. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the places where we have offices are in Jerusalem, Amman, and, Ju and in Beirut. Out of the Beirut office, we also are working with Egypt, with Syria, parts of Iraq, and of course with Lebanon. Right now, we are very concerned with regard to the situation in the Middle East. We're concerned with the violence in uh, Israel and Palestine. We're also very concerned with the elections that you all know are coming up on May 15th uh, in Lebanon. So this is a particular concern that we have now. Uh, at the beginning of June, I will be traveling with Trisul and with Thomas to the Middle East. We will go we will be visiting our offices in those three locations. It's a major concern. Another major concern that is really of news that has been breaking really within the last 24 to 48 hours is the, the ongoing situation and the violence and the suppression of news getting out from Ethiopia, particularly in the Tigray region. Thomas, do you want to comment further on that? Eritrea is a place where it's very difficult as a U.S. passport holder to enter in. You know, they do, 
the visas are not even provided so easily. So they go into where you were born, who's your father, and all kinds of information, and they grant you a visa to enter Eritrea. It is the northern, northeastern part of Ethiopia, a small strip of land, and Ethiopia is the southern part. These two countries have been in war for a small piece of land for many, many years. And now, uh, just a few days before, we, our director or sister uh, of the Daughters of Charity, she runs the office there, and I was in conversation with her on the phone, and she said, Thomas, our superior just called us to start praying. Suddenly, and I said, what happened? Yeah. There was a standstill, there was some sort of a peace arrangement between the two countries, and it's burning right now. They started bombing again, and some of our sisters are injured on the border, and we just do not know where it is going now. It's, the war is again erupted. So, it's very difficult, and the sad part is, who is fighting this war? There's a, uh, a group which is very at the border, which is, they feel that that's their homeland has nothing to do with the federal government. So they're kind of protecting that piece of land. And on the Eritrean side is, is the young students, once you are into high school, after 10th, you have to join the military, like you are drafted into the military school. It is a mandatory thing that you have to serve the military. But they signed the contract for 18 months. What happens is this 18 months never ends. You're forever there. And what, when the war began, some of the soldiers, these young, both boys and girls, they started returning back, but most of them were maimed. They, some have lost their leg, they've lost their hand, they've lost their eyes. And they come to this family who they thought, my child will grow up eventually and become a breadwinner. No more. So that's the situation. And it come out kind of truncated somewhere and it's suppressed. But I've seen that, gone to that place and I've seen this is this terrible. And such is the situation in that place. Thank you. Thomas, could you also comment on the situation in India and the complication? Well, now, what's happening right now is the current government, they have brought in a new legislation. We have an office in Ernakulam, southern Kerala, and uh, the new legislation has brought in this strict, very stringent laws stating that no funds from foreign should come in to uh, funding in, uh, in, I have an office, if Kanima has an office, we cannot send the monies across to this fund, this our office, to transfer the monies to where the need is. It has to be transferred directly to the institution which run a program. Now, what if I do that, okay, that's fine, but in doing so, each of these institutions or congregations must have a they call it as FCRA, calling the Foreign Currency Regulation Act, uh, registration. If you do not have that, you cannot receive foreign currency. So what they, they're asking us to send it to this institution, but on the other side, they're cancelling that registration. So in effect, all these orphanages, all these institutions, we had so many street children brought into the institutions, now they're back on the streets. So it's kind of getting a bit of difficult in India, but we're striving hard. Some of them they have applied and waiting for a registration, a renewal of the registration, and and as mentioned, how we work in how the religious and the priests work in India. Always we think the sisters are the foot soldiers. These women, brave women, they are the foot soldiers. And they go out there into villages where restrictions are there. And they work with, they'll say, oh, you are the farmers. You want to go out in the field, we'll take care of your children. We'll look after, we'll do the babysitting. That's how it all, kind of a, they call it as balwadis. They look after the little, little babies until you come back. 
So that's how they finally they understand them and they accept them into the village. I've seen sisters who've been sleeping under a tree for two years. That's their house under the tree until they're permitted into the village. So this foot soldiers known as the, the congregation, the sisters out there, they're brave women and they penetrate into there and they teach. The layman comes in to catechism is given. And once the catechism is developed, he goes into it and a small mission group is generated and he goes into the mission and a small chapel is created. A chapel, then a church and the school and the church side by side goes through. So, so most of the villages, that's what's happening. And some of the villages are brand new Christians. Brand new. So we try to help them out, the villages, in doing so. Thank you. Asking the question in other places. Any other? Are there any other questions or anything else that I can share with you? Well, again, I thank you all for being here and taking the time to be here. And I even call on the distinguished Monsignor Fink to be all right. So if I, <laughs> I've known Monsignor Fink for, for many years, and it is a great honor and privilege. He is an inspiration to all of us on many, many levels. So Monsignor Fink, if you would grace us by coming and offering a closing prayer. Up until uh, Monsignor Vicari's last words about me, he was telling me the truth about everything tonight. He's uh, got a little carried away there. Thank you, thank you, Peter. You know, as I've listened to this, um, it's such an inspiration to see the work my friend is doing and his staff. And um, I, I just wonder, I'd ask you, how many people in the pews these days do you think know anything about any of this and I think this could be multiplied many times over uh, how many people what they know about the church is just uh, network news or cable news and you don't hear this kind of stuff um, and anything as big uh, and universal as the church it's going to and it's made up of human beings it's easy to take shots at it, pick it apart, and like we can do to each other. But this kind of thing is being done, and our people should know about it. And we should take a certain a pride in it, in a healthy pride. Uh, we're not a, a sick, just a sick institution. We do a lot of great work in the world, and that's possible as uh, when Senior Vicari said, because of the generosity of so many of our people. But I, I dare say that in the parishes I help out in, if I mentioned Kaniwa uh, and their work, it would come as a complete surprise to many of them. Um, so I'd encourage you to be uh, ambassadors, you know, and to let people know. And uh, if, you, if you have a family or friends, who can't think of a good thing to say about the church. Tell them about this. Tell them about this. Terrible things are happening in the world. And, and the church, through Kanewa and the Knights of Columbus and uh, other organizations are there in these terrible places trying the best they can to help in very, very difficult circumstances. So God bless all of you for the great work you do. Really wonderful. So closing prayer. Good and gracious God, Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this evening and for the wonderful work of Kaniwa and the generosity of so many people that makes their work possible. We give you thanks for your gifts of life and love, faith, family, and friends for the beauty of the earth that hints at the treasures you have stored up for us in the splendor of heaven. But most of all, we thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, who comes to us as the way, the truth, and the life. He's Christ, our King, Prince of Peace, and yet we, his followers, whom he called his friends, have so often been disloyal and disobedient and have failed 
so miserably at being instruments of his peace. Forgive us our trespasses, Father. Give us the grace to walk in the way he has shown us, in the truth he has revealed, and as ministers and servants of the rich, full, joyful life of which he is both the exemplar and the source. Let the blessed power of your spirit bring peace to our broken hearts and our broken world, most especially to the Ukraine and the Middle East. May peoples of all nations, races, and religions come increasingly to recognize in each other true brothers and sisters, all your beloved children, and to treat each other with the forgiveness and forbearance, the gentleness and generosity with which we pray you will treat us in spite of our sins. Father of mercies, through the ministry of your angels, the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and of all your saints, through the grace of your Son and the power of your Holy Spirit, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Be pleased to hear our prayer, for it is offered to our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you all, especially these wonderful people and the work they do. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.